From the Toronto Star, I'm Rudy Mudder, and this matters. Twas the weeks before Christmas, and all through the land, people were online shopping for gifts for their clan. E-commerce is growing, and the order systems are flowing. Until there came a stop. Enter the Grinch Bot. These programs are scary, making shoppers find nary a video game console, graphic cards, and more. With other problems like supply chains, these bots are adding consumer pain. So U.S. Congress has decided to take up the cause, but many are unsure how these new laws might make them pause. Happy holiday season, everybody! And for those of you out there who are doing your shopping now, may the odds be ever in your favor. It's tough out there with well-known supply chain issues, but now we are also competing with bots who are making it even tougher to find hot ticket items online. Jake Roach is a senior writer on computing at DigitalTrends.com. He recently wrote about bots and online shopping and is here to discuss. Jake, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so Jake, now there's a bit of news that I really want to get into, but I want to be very clear and explain something here because the term "bot" is used a lot in computing. But in the world of online shopping, what do we want to be talking about here? Yeah, so there are several different kinds of bots that you'll encounter online, and most of them are good. You know, there are bots that scrape prices from websites to make price comparison tools or check inventory and all of that. For what we're talking about today, though, we're talking about bad bots, which can do all sorts of stuff. But the goal of them is to bypass whatever measures a website could have in place, or to be faster than a human could to buy something that's really in demand. This is it. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about this is what has been dubbed Grinch bots, and of course, this is something that anyone who has tried to buy a new video game console, a hot PC graphics card, or limited edition sneakers are acutely aware of. Can you talk to me a little bit about that experience for the people who are looking for those things in particular? Yeah, yeah. So there really isn't a one size fits all on what the bots do, but generally what they're looking to do is enter information like billing address, credit cards, all of that stuff very quickly, and be able to add the product to their cart and check out before a human can. And if everything goes according to plan for the bot, they can do that in you know milliseconds, much faster than a human could. So yeah, they go in ahead of time before someone has a chance to buy something, and they steal them. Okay, so now this is a problem that's always been plaguing people for a long time. We're going to get into concert tickets because that was sort of the thin edge of the wedge here. But this is going to be an issue for online commerce going forward, particularly for any type of hot ticket item. And now, what you wrote about is last week, members of the U.S. Congress introduced the Stopping Grinch Bot Act. What is that exactly? Yeah, so it's an extension of a law that was passed in 2016 called the Bots Act, which mainly applied to ticket sales, to concert tickets, musicals, things like that. That outlawed the use of bots or tickets sold that were obtained via a bot. And it sounds like this stopping Grinch bots bill is doing something similar. We don't have the text of the bill yet. It was introduced on the 30th, but from the press release and from what I know about it, it sounds like it's doing the same thing. Okay, I really, really love framing these guys as Grinch bots stealing Christmas. I think this is a wonderful branding opportunity here for this sort of fight. But let's talk about this sort of. It expands existing legislation you mentioned covering concert tickets. It's also the first federal. There have been other states that have them. Can you talk a little bit about the legislation? And then here's the tricky part: Does legislation work? Right. I believe there are five or six U.S. states that have them. I know California, Oregon, and New York are the ones that I looked into, and they help. This is a thing that ultimately is a step in the right direction because you know if you don't outlaw the use of bots or you don't outlaw people selling products that they got through a bot, it's a race to the bottom, right? As people buy more products online, and especially right now when supply is tight, eventually people are going to resort to buying their own bot, even though they don't plan to resell something, right? So it's a positive step in the right direction. The big problem is, is how do you enforce something like this? You know, in the U.S., this applies to the Federal Trade Commission, and it gives them the power to enforce this, and that's great. But it's going to take quite a few years before the FTC is able to track down people that. 
that are worth going after. Number one, gather evidence that they have even used a bot and then bring a lawsuit against them. So it's not the kind of quick response that I think a lot of people were hoping for when there's you know some item that's really in demand. Well, I think this is interesting because the Congress members who did this, like they were saying that they hoped that this could actually help this Christmas. There's no way that's happening, right? Absolutely not. Yeah. And that was what was funny about reading this press release that came out is that they're going to, you know, stop the Grinches from stealing Christmas. But, you know, we don't even have text of the bill yet. There's a pretty good chance it doesn't even pass and get signed into law before Christmas. And as far as the FTC enforcing it before Christmas, absolutely not. Okay. One of the things we should talk about is that Canada actually has one of these laws as well. It was very much created in 2015 to target scalpers and ticket sales. I can tell you, I covered this when it came out. I think some of the same issues exist here. I still buy tickets and I'm telling you, it has not become that much easier. In fact, these days, if I really want tickets, I go through all the hoops. I sign up for the artist pre-sales. I get there early. I get into the queue. And yet, it's still incredibly hard. And right afterward, those tickets are being sold online at reseller sites. So I'm just talking about my first experience. I mean, in the U.S., in the Bots Act, that hasn't really done anything to stop ticket scalping yet. Has it really? No, no. The FTC brought one lawsuit so far in the beginning of 2021 almost five years after it was signed in the law. So they aren't too eager to get things done. So there's a larger issue here with how we buy products online right now with supply and demand and with how bots are able to grow and react to these different types of security measures. So this legislation is good. Like I said, it's a step in the right direction. But at the end of the day, people are still going to circumvent whatever security measures a website has in place to buy a product that's in demand. There are different ways that websites can stop that, that retailers can stop that. But whenever they release some sort of thing to protect against bots, the people who are developing bots find a new way around it, right? And then you get into this mess of where the people who are building bots and using bots, where they're located, the different ways that they can fool a website into where they're located. And it just gets really messy. So the legislation is good inherently, but once you get down to the kind of practicality of it, it gets really hard to enforce. You brought up something that I was just about to ask about, and it's the idea of a technological cold war. On one side here, you have the companies trying to fight off these bots and try to get their products in the hands of real consumers. But on the other side, you have these bot developers, and they're just both trying to thwart each other's efforts, right? Sure, sure, absolutely. And any sort of cybersecurity is someone chasing their tails, developers chasing their tails and hoping that what they have now is good enough for the time being. Then you brought up the idea of jurisdiction. I think this is a really, really interesting work because, of course, what's the best thing about the Internet? It's worldwide. One of the big things with all these things is, first, you're going to have to find them. And then, two, if there is even a way that they can be prosecuted depending on your laws, right? That's a huge thing with this. Right. Absolutely. And so, again, we don't have the text of the actual bill, but, you know, even if it was illegal to buy a product, you know, let's say somebody's located in another country and they buy a product through a U.S. retailer and they sell it through some sort of U.S. marketplace or to a U.S. customer. I'm not sure if that would be outlawed under it, but even if it was outlawed under it, you have a whole mess of trying to bring a lawsuit against somebody in another country. And honestly, like the FTC is just not going to go those lengths unless it's some really big fish that's you know buying up a lot of stuff and really causing problems. We'll be right back. You bring up the idea of banning bots. That's probably not on the table. Do you think it should be? And then how do you actually do that? Yeah, so we can't ban bots. The estimates are different depending on who you ask, but somewhere between like 40% all the way up to maybe 70% of traffic on the internet is bots. And the vast majority of those bots are doing good things. So if we ban bots, we have a much less functional internet. So we need bots. Banning the use of bots in this way is good and it's a positive development, but going about enforcing it, like I said, it's a little tough. You could go after individual users. You could go after, like I said, the big fish, the people that are using it for, you know, to buy up lots and lots of product. But at the end of the day, I think the most effective way to go about it is to go to the developers of these bots. And that's something critically that isn't in the Bots Act that we have in the United States. I'm not sure if it'll be in this new bill, but that is something that we haven't really explored here in the U.S. 
Well, it's interesting. It's one of those things that we've just recently seen Apple suing NSO Corp, creators of spyware. And this is, I believe, that approach you're just talking about right now. Basically, go after the people who have made this part of their business, right? Yeah, because the people who are using the bots, they aren't developing them. At least the majority of them aren't developing the bots to use. They're buying them from somebody else. And, you know, these things happen on forums or in Facebook groups or things like that. But developers are going to keep making them. And as long as they're making them and resellers see an opportunity for in-demand products, they're going to use them. So I think you go to the root of the problem and, you know, maybe not outlaw the development of it. Because, again, that gets messy with how many good bots are developed but start looking at the people that are putting out these bad faith bots, if you will. Let's talk about enforcement. And I'm wondering if one of the issues here is whether the authorities are tech savvy enough to really tackle this issue. So, yeah, and I think you get a lot of the lack of knowledge in that area just from reading how the Grinch bots bill is framed. But, you know, I don't think that the FTC will go to those lengths. I think that sort of thing will be helpful. But if you look at something like the Bots Act, that has a federal budget of like $500,000 a year, which is very, very little, right? And so I can't imagine they're dedicating too many resources to something like this. Let me ask you something. You ever used a bot to buy anything? No, no, not myself. I've been flagged as a bot before, myself personally, but I have not used a bot. How difficult is it? Like, if we're talking about sort of, you know, a war of the bots, like, is it worth it to me to try and figure out how to do this and then go off and try and get myself a PS5 or an Xbox? You know, I don't think it's worth it because at the end of the day, again, I talked about that race to the bottom type of mentality. The more that people become aware of bots and how to acquire them, I feel like more and more people will maybe dip their toes into that. And then you just have, instead of humans competing for the option to add a product to their cart, you have bots competing for it. And so, no, I wouldn't recommend doing that. I've been able to purchase a PlayStation. I've gotten four or five Xboxes, not to resell. I've gotten them for friends and family who wanted them and a new graphics card all without using a bot. Oh, well, geez, maybe you should just start a sideline business there, bud. <laughs> That's more success than I know a lot of people. I have ethics, so... <laughs> Well, hang on a second. So this bill, like what I don't get about this is that this does seem to be like a super winner in terms of a political front. It's consumer protectionism, really, right? And so the question is, I think, how do you get people to care enough to try and actually tackle this? So yeah, and what you mentioned as far as politically, yes, it is a slam dunk win. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it came shortly after Cyber Monday when all this stuff is going on and it's framed in this way that it's going to solve this Christmas. If you read the press release as well, they don't mention consoles or graphics cards. They mention toys and parents, right? So this is definitely set up in a way that is supposed to be a political win. As far as the practicality of it, it's not going to get there. And I imagine that this is mostly meant to win good favor amongst people who are interested in buying any of these products and really nothing more. Considering when you mentioned your rate of success, what's your practical advice here? How are you finding all this hard to find stuff? I'm just looking, right? I follow Twitter accounts. I am ready for when things are coming online and I try and find them. You know, for like a graphics card, I went to an in-store restock at Best Buy. You know, for my PS5, I was lucky enough to get one shortly after the pre-orders went live. So it's various different ways, but mostly just watching Twitter and trying to pay attention to when things are coming out. This sounds a lot like me and ticket buying now. So basically, it's one of those to beat the bots, you just have to put a bunch more effort in, really. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, it's easy to land on a product page when something new comes out and to see it out of stock and just go, oh my God, the bots, right? Especially after you see all the scalpers on eBay and, you know, all of that afterwards, right? But it's important to remember that just because something is in demand doesn't necessarily mean that bots grabbed up everything, right? The reason why we're seeing bots is because there is a guarantee that demand will exceed supply, right? We have a chip shortage going on right now, which is why the consoles and graphics cards are hard to find. Ticket sales are inherently scarce, right? You only have so many seats. Sneakers, they're set up to be limited drops, right? And so that's when the bots actually show up. And so I think that there's this kind of misconception that if the bots weren't there, that it would be easier to find these products so that you could just go to the store and buy them. And that's not the case. These are products that were going to sell out one way or another. At least it's nice to be able to blame the bots if you miss out on getting that bot thing. But I also do think the largest thing about this is that we just have so much stuff. And obviously we are in a supply chain crisis right now, which has exacerbated this whole thing. 
I'm with you. I don't like the bots. I don't think they are the Grinch that's stealing Christmas. They're not a help, though. <laughs> but Jake, this has been fantastic for us. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you think our listeners should know about this? Yeah, yeah. I think I want to talk a little bit about anti-bot measures and what retailers could be doing more of and maybe what they shouldn't be doing. You know, you hear a lot about retailers need to have more anti-bot measures in place. And that's good, right? It's important to have checks to make sure that things aren't weird and that a human's actually buying something. But this is something I experienced recently with the Steam Deck. So, you know, a little handheld gaming piece that was only sold through Steam. Right. And I was able to get one after about 30 minutes. That was the example I was talking about when I was flagged as a bot. And I don't think many bots were able to pick up those devices. And a big reason why is that Valve, the company that sold it, they put in an account system, basically like an account verification system where you had to have a certain purchase on your account. You couldn't have bans and, you know, all of these different things to verify that these people were real. They were actually buying it and they weren't just a bot or a scalper account. Right. And so those things work. And I think at the end of the day, that is the most effective way to get around it. It's not to detect the bot because you keep trying to detect the bot, you know, developers are going to keep finding new ways to get around that detection. It's to put something in at the retailer level to make sure accounts are legitimate. The problem is then is how much of that privacy and how much of that kind of freedom of buying a product do customers want to give up. And I think that's kind of the rub right now is that retailers could put in measures to circumvent bots. But at the end of the day, that's probably bad for them. And customers may not want to jump on board. It's an interesting point. And I think it's the idea about having a relationship with that customer too, right? Like I said, for the My Tickets thing, I joined the fan page. I joined the fan club just so I can get the pre-sale password. So that's the type of thing, right? Yeah, and absolutely. And that's the best way. Like if there's any sort of in-demand product, you know, I mentioned Twitter accounts, but there are other retailers who, you know, mainly communicate their new products through social media and they maybe have a small social media presence or things like that. And the thing about bots is that they're generally not used by people who are interested in those products, right? They're used by people who want to resell them. So if you can find a retailer or a community that's close, that's tight knit and, you know, kind of doesn't broadcast whenever new things are in stock, you probably have a good chance of finding it. Well, Jake, that's good advice entering to this very busy and obviously a uh, short supply holiday season. I really, really want to thank you for your time today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Jake Roach is a senior writer on computing at digitaltrends.com. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Raju Mudder. Our This Matters team is Adrian Chung, Brian Bradley, JP Fozo, Matt Hearn, Morgan Bockneck, Saba Etizaz, and Sean Pattenden. Our music is by so-called Mike DeAngelis and Sean Pattenden. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to this matters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com slash subscribing matters. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. <laughs>